kingdom compliance with Dr. James Brookin, offering biblical guidelines, principles of the kingdom of heaven that will help you stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven and reap the benefits that accompany you as a citizen of the kingdom. The best the king has to offer. Today's topic, let's talk about love. The Apostle John writes in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. The kingdom of heaven is established upon love. Love is a kingdom covenant law. The nature of someone or something expresses the essential features resident in it. As believers, our Heavenly Father has made us partakers of His divine nature through His exceedingly great and precious promises, which begins with love, since God is love. So clearly, the solid foundation of the kingdom of God begins with love. Like the Word of God, love is eternal and love never fails. The word love, as used in this context, is the Greek word agape, taken from agapio, which means love in a social or moral sense, affection or benevolence, a love feast, charity, dear love. Agape actually talks about and references love that is unconditional. It's unconditional love. So this description references the divine, self-sacrificial, unconditional love of God shown toward us and given from his heart of benevolence with pure motives. This same love has been shed abroad in our hearts by Holy Spirit, who is given to us. So we too are obligated through New Testament commandment to give to others the same love God has given to each of us. Because as Paul says in Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Wow. How awesome is that? When we received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, Holy Spirit, our comforter, was given to us as a gift. And with that gift came love. God himself, the very nature of God is love, which also is the primary fruit of Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. The body of Christ is currently in the midst of a cold war. In other words, the cold war is a cold love toward one another. In history, a cold war is the period of hostility short of open warfare. Now, between the years 1945 and 1991, history records a cold war between Russia and the United States. As believers, we can understand this from a physical perspective because the Word of God says in Matthew 24, 7, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. But within the body of Christ, there should not be a cold war marked by believers not loving one another. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 13, is Christ divided? No. Therefore, as his body, we should not be divided either. As the body of Christ, believers, whose mandate is to be Christ-like, we should always abound in the one thing that gave us life to begin with. And we see that in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Greek word used in the scripture, John 3, 16, for divided is marizo, which means to disunite, to differ, to be different, to divide. Scripture makes it clear that the body of Christ is not to be divided. And so that's why the Apostle Paul says, is Christ divided? Obviously not. So then the body should not be divided either. Rather, we should walk in genuine love for one another, exhorting one another in humility. In other words, we should be like-minded, Christ-like-minded. Now here's how the Apostle Paul says it. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, if there is any consolation or encouragement in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, and if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness 
of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. There it is. Listen, the body of Christ is divided in many areas, but specifically in the arena of politics in our physical, natural world. In the United States of America, evangelicals tend to side with the Republican agenda and have shut out other members of the body of Christ who have a view that is different from or opposes the Republican agenda. Likewise, there are many believers who tend to side with the agenda of the Democrats, and they too draw a dividing line in the sand opposing their brothers and sisters in Christ. As the Apostle James says in James 3.10, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. So how did the body of Christ become so divided? Well, I believe that many have prioritized loving and serving mammon to acquire physical things and influence and power as opposed to seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, trusting God to provide all our need. I believe that's part of the blame. In other words, the body of Christ has been duped into loving the world more than loving God. Now, we know that there are consequences to that. Let's take a look at that in Scripture. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Get that. If you prioritize the world or the material things that you love in the world over loving God, over prioritizing God's word, the love of the Father is not in you. Let's pick that up in verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And watch this, the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Well, there's the distinguishing factor. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these physical material things are passing away and the lust that comes with them. But guess what? Whoever abides in the word of God and trusts God, you remain and abide forever. Clearly, the world, as used in the above context that I just read, refers to human life in opposition to God. Non-belief, or non-trust. Apostle John said that if you love the world, you oppose God. That's what he basically says. The love of the Father is not in you. If we live according to the world's values, which are composed of evil schemes, we do not love God. Instead, we gravitate toward the desires of our sin-tainted human nature. We become covetous, greedy for more and more material things, and we boast greatly in our status and achievements. These things are not of God. As Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew, chapter 16, verse 26, for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The body of Christ, the just, is supposed to live by faith. Galatians 3 and 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And because faith works by love, many believers have not diligently stood firm in their faith because their love walk is weak. Not their faith in Jesus Christ but their faith in adhering to the word of God, the principles of the kingdom, as it relates to the believer's life on earth. If your love walk is not pure, your faith walk is tainted. I'll say that again. If your love walk is not pure, your faith walk is tainted. Scripture backs this up, Galatians 5 and 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Listen, we live in the world, but we are not of the world. Let's see if we can expound upon that just a little bit more. From the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 11, and then verses 15 through 17. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. So this is Jesus talking. And I am come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be one as we are. Let's jump to verse 15. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, 
but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Listen, I really don't believe people hate one another as much as they are afraid of one another. As humans, we tend to be intimidated by those who look, think, and behave differently than we do. The result in many cases can generally be seen in the form of some kind of defense bent on superiority and carried out in an evil way which tends to inflict some measure of harm. Cause separation, discrimination, racism, prejudice, bigotry. If only people would love one another. Well, how does the body of Christ come together in the unity of the faith through love? How do we do that? I think, first of all, we must understand our position in Christ and become kingdom compliant. That is, strict adherence to the word of God, not the evil systems of the world built by man. We must put off the old man and put on the new man and walk in love. Let's back that up with scripture. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. In Christ, we all find fulfilled lives in spite of racial, class, or cultural differences. Okay, why? Because we are in Christ and Christ has fulfilled all things. So the body of Christ tends to go to the extreme to prove or justify their righteousness and when we don't have to. Many have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, as Paul teaches in Romans 10. And zeal without knowledge of true righteousness is dangerous. It's like putting a stick of dynamite in the hands of a child as a toy or giving a child a hand grenade to play with. Jesus died on the cross at Calvary between two thieves. One repented and was received into paradise. Notice that Jesus was in the middle. He did not sway to the right or to the left. He simply invited both thieves to receive salvation through him. One did and the other did not. Let's pick up that story in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Listen, as a general principle, wickedness shortens life and justice prolongs life. But this is not always so. Nevertheless, the body of Christ must understand the wisdom of moderation. I believe that taking the extreme, radical, and rigid path, the rigid mindset of self-righteousness freezes your righteous desires and locks you out of the infinite benefits that flow from the kingdom and keeps you from receiving God's best. And listen, the kingdom of God, and we as citizens of the kingdom, it's about the benefits of the kingdom, the best that God has to offer. Let's take a look at that in scripture. In the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 15 through 18. Here's what Solomon says. I have seen everything in my days of vanity. There is a just man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs life in his wickedness. Do not be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you grasp this and also not remove your hand from the other. For he who fears God will escape them all. Wow. It is my posture and belief that the only rigid mindset the body of Christ must have and maintain without compromise is our genuine love for one another and to walk by faith 
in the word of God, the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus being rooted and grounded and settled in love. In God's mind and eyes, we are all one, his sons and daughters, who also possess the same spiritual DNA of his son, Jesus. So here's the bottom line. As we like to say in the South, here's the skinny of it all. Let's take a look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew. Now, I want to insert something there. Neither Greek nor Jew, as we just talked about the body of Christ being divided, especially here in the United States, between political party. Let's look at verse 11 and let's substitute Greek nor Jew for Republican nor Democrat. I'll read the whole thing again and we'll put that in. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there is neither Republican nor Democrat circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, watch this, but Christ is all and in all. Because the body of Christ is guilty of not genuinely loving its fellow brothers and sisters of the faith, we've opened the door for lawlessness in our lives, just as the systems of this world thrive on lawlessness. And the Gospel of Matthew Verse 24 and 12 says, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And that's exactly what is taking place. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 1 and 1, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. We're doing exactly what Apostle Paul warns us not to do. Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's no getting around the fact that God is revealed through our love for one another. When love controls our thoughts and behavior and is shown to others, it becomes the same benevolent gift God gave believers through his son, Jesus. This means that it is perfected in and through us by the indwelling Holy Spirit when genuinely shown toward others. To this end, it becomes the believer's primary obligation and his highest birthright, making love a foundation of the kingdom of heaven. John 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. James 2, 8. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Therefore, love is the primary wavelength via Holy Spirit that transmits the frequency of heaven to earth. Let's close with 1 John 4 and 7 through 13. Get a hold of this. Beloved, let us love one another, for God is of love, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loves us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loves us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we have boldness. We may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. People, God wants us to be made perfect in love, completed in it, rooted, grounded, settled, built up, walking in love. It's about love. If you would like to refer this episode to others, 
click on share and subscribe to the YouTube channel to stay up to date when we drop new episodes. On our next episode, we'll discuss Faith Rises to the Occasion. Thank you for joining me. I hope you'll join me next time for Kingdom Compliance with Dr. James Cooper, where we stay tuned in to the frequency of heaven.